unto us now, whether through me or in spite of me, that we might be inspired, that we might experience your exhortation of the Scriptures to go out to do and live as you have called us to do. Gracious and loving God, speak unto us now, whether through me or in spite of me. For this we pray. Amen. This week marks our final week in our exploration of the early church, the church of the book of Acts. We have been studying the church for nearly two months. We have heard about how the church transforms lives. We have heard about how the church unites us, how the church heals us, how it sets the captives free, how it ends discrimination. But now we come to the heart of the church, the mission of the church, the most important job of the church that ties and holds all of the others together. Namely, that the church preaches Christ Jesus. In our story this morning, we hear about the Apostle Paul and Barnabas on one of their missionary journeys. They have arrived in Presidia Antioch. And they have come to the synagogue on the Sabbath. And they, they take their seats at the back of the, the synagogue. And they listen as the scriptures of the day, the law and the prophets, are proclaimed from before them. And then, right about the time that the sermon would have began, the, the elders and the officials of the synagogue sent messengers to Paul and Barnabas sitting there in the pews and say to them, if you have any exhortation for this congregation, stand up now and speak as visitors. Paul and Barnabas' reputation preceded them. Not many could enter into a church, sit down as a visitor, and suddenly be called to give the sermon that day. And yet Paul was called to do just that. And so with the motion of his hand, he stands before the congregation, and he begins to speak. Men of Israel and all who feared God, listen. And he recounts the story of Israel. He recounts how they had been slaves in Egypt. And how they had served their masters. But yet they grew. And God brought them out of slavery and into the promised land. He recounts how they spent 40 years in the wilderness. Before entering that promised land. And he tells them how God cleared it all out and how God made it ready for them. And then when they entered in, how God appointed over them judges whenever there was a need, men and women alike, able to lead the people. But it was not enough for the people of Israel. They were jealous of the kingdoms that surrounded them, of the kings and the political power of their neighbors. And so they demanded to God in the time of the prophet and priest Samuel for a king. And so God selected for them the man Saul, son of Kish, to be their king. And he reigned for 40 years. But King Saul was not a man after God's heart. He was a man who strayed from the path and so God saw that it was necessary to find a new leader for his people. And he found in David, the son of Jesse, a man truly after his heart. A man that would do his will in all things. And so he made David king. And David reigned over Israel. And he was a good king. And 
God promised the people of Israel that David's line would rule over Israel for all of eternity. That from his loins and his descendants, a Savior would come that would reunite the people with God. This was a promise that the Israelites held onto as their kingdom divided and as they lost wars and were sent into exile, into Assyria and into Babylon. It was the promise spoken of by the prophets time and time again until the day came when Jesus, a descendant of David, the Son of God, was born on earth. And God preceded David with his cousin John the Baptist who proclaimed a baptism of repentance for Israel and who prepared the way for the Lord and made straight the paths in the desert. John, who continually appointed to Jesus throughout his ministry, proclaiming that he, Jesus, was the Savior and that John was not even fit to untie the thongs of his sandals. This same Jesus, who would go and perform miracles and, and do ministry throughout all of Judea, who the religious leaders and the rulers would find fault with and would persecute those religious leaders who could not find reason to condemn him to death, and yet still, out of their blindness for Jesus' fulfillment of the promise of God, still sentenced him to Pilate, and to crucifixion. And Christ died. There on the cross. For the forgiveness of sins. The sins of their ancestors. Their sins. And the sins of the children yet to come. And when all had been fulfilled that God had written, Christ was taken down from that cross and laid into the tomb. But God's story was not done. For God raised up Christ, and that which was raised up would not perish and would not succumb to decay. And while King David, who had ruled during his generation, had laid asleep and was put to rest with his fathers and decayed, Christ would never come to decay, for he was the Son of God, the beloved Son, whom God had begotten, and whom God would not allow to decay. And in Christ's hands, he would place the kingdom of God. And he would give us the opportunity for new life. That through Christ, we and they and all that have ever come and all that are yet to come have been made free from sin and from death. Free from the law of Moses. This was the good news that Paul proclaimed. And he warned the people there in the synagogue, that they should not come to be some of the foolish, some that were also prophesied, those that, that wouldn't even see the miracle, even as it was described to them. And the people heard the message. They had been hungry to understand God's word, hungry to find fulfillment in their soul. And through the message of Jesus Christ, they found that fulfillment. And it says that they begged Paul and Barnabas to come back the following week and to preach the good news again. And some of them even decided to follow Paul and Barnabas around. Jews and converts alike all followed Paul and Barnabas around trying to learn and experience the grace of God. That is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It fills the whole within each of our souls. The need for something more. That need that, that 
itch that we try to scratch with all of the things of this world, with those, the ideas that if we just had a little bit more money, or if we looked just a little bit better, or if our spouse or our, or our significant other would love us just a little bit more, or, or if our children were just a little bit more perfect, or, or whatever. That whole, that longing, that lacking that we feel can only be filled by the power of Jesus Christ. That message was bestowed upon his church. And as Jesus had appeared to his disciples over the course of weeks after his resurrection, they began to testify and spread the good news. Just as Paul had come to the synagogue that day and told the good news then. Brothers and sisters, and all you who fear God, who long to be a part of the church. This is our mission. This is our reason to exist, the meaning of our lives, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to all the world, to use the 70, 80, 90, 100 years that we are given here on earth to make an impact in the world that affects eternity. By helping others come to know Christ. All of the healing that the church is able to do is by the power of the word and the message of Christ. The healing to the brokenhearted, the recovering of sight to the blind, the hearing to the deaf and voice to the mute. The power to set the captives free from sin and death resides within the life and death of Christ. The message that we share, the message of salvation for the world. We are united in the message and discrimination is ended under the message and lives are transformed through the message. It is who we are. It is what we are meant to do and what we are meant to be. It is a message that runs contrary to the world, a message that calls for a complete reversal in all the things that are, a message that serves no nation and no political entity, no politician and no ruler, but instead a message that is radical, a message that is liberal, that calls for a complete and utter change to the hierarchies and the conceptions of humanity. A message that says that those who are poor shall be raised up and receive all that they need, and those who are rich shall be made low, and all that they have in abundance shall be taken from them. It is a message that is proclaimed to those who are humble, that they shall be exalted and raised up and given places of honor, and those who are haughty and arrogant and self-righteous shall be lowered down and given humiliation. It is a message about those who live their lives selfishly, seeking to save themselves, will lose their lives and perish while well, those who live selflessly and live to save the lives of others and make the world a better place shall be granted life in Christ. It is a message that proclaims that the sinner shall be forgiven and those who believe themselves to be righteous and above the judgment will find the eternal punishment. And so we are faced with questions. Are we, are you, the sinner 
in desperate need of God's mercy and salvation? Or are you the righteous one who is above God's help, who has done all of the right things on your own? Are you the one who has all that you have deserved and everything that you own is something that you have worked hard for? Or are you someone who relies solely upon the blessings of God and understand that nothing in your possession, not your stuff, not your breath in your lungs, not your family or anything else has been deserved but is only given by the grace of God unto you? Are you someone who sits in the seat of judgment? Or are you one who stands there to be convicted, looking for mercy? Are you one who has control over your own life, who can make the decisions for how you shall live? Or are you one that has given up your life to Christ, who has died to sin? And now must live for the will of God over your own. Christ died for their sins, the sins of our ancestors. Christ died for our sins, and Christ died for the sins of those yet to come. And he calls us to come and die to those sins. That we might be given that new life, the new creation, and our new purpose in God. That we might become the church that preaches Christ Jesus, that proclaims God's salvation to the world. That is what the church is all about. The message of Jesus Christ. The living son of the living God who came, died, and resurrected for us. Amen.